On today's show, I've got a few concept cars that are sure to excite, Rolls-Royce goes electric in the skies, and let's talk about Tesla's energy offering in Victoria. Kicking off today's show, it's concept car time. So grain of salt stuff, yeah? Syac, that's the same company who makes like MG's Volkswagen uh, GM cars over in like uh, China for that Pan-Asian and sometimes wider market, they've unveiled this good looking thing. It's vision of future mobility that explores the boundaries between like urban mobility and wearable technology, I kid you not. This motorbike open car thing is a car that Syek says you can actually wear. Yeah, I'm going to do a lot of inverted commas for the next few minutes, so apologies. It features like a jacket and a vehicle that interlock to start it. There's no need for a key. So, okay, what's, what's wrong with having like a, a low energy Bluetooth uh, kind of uh, key, key fob thing? Or, you know, mobile phones, which, you know, Tesla actually started and now other car makers are copying. I don't, I don't get it, just go with that. Mm -hmm. But taking this fusion idea aside, Syac says that the concept is designed to achieve like the ultimate ease of use. That is like a motorcycle, um, agility, Combine that with a car and its stability. Hey, it kind of rhymes. Good job, Chris. It, it looks equally awesome and equally scary. I mean, what would happen if like someone hits you or you hit them? You're just gonna go flying like you would on a motorbike. This just seems a little too perilous for my liking. Sticking with Sayek, here's another concept car that actually looks safe and perhaps a potential winner. Sleek, sporty, low pocket rocket. What other terms could I describe it? Purple, yeah, definitely purple. Syac says that the MG Maze is aimed at the next generation of motorists. Bringing the fun and pioneering spirit that has always defined MG firmly into the 21st century. The MG Maze is a compact urban two-seater that features a transparent shell, emulating high-end gaming PCs in its outer surface that has aspects of the uh, chassis and interior design that is normally hidden from view. On the inside, floating seats and a user interface has been developed with gamers in mind. And, <laughs> and get this, steering is controlled not by a steering wheel, but by the driver's smartphone. Hmm, concept car indeed. Lotus, the beloved sports car brand, which Tesla actually used uh, to for its first generation Roadster, has unveiled a new lightweight EV architecture. Featuring multiple layouts with batteries surprisingly being located to the rear of front passengers in this what they call it in chest for, uh, format, yeah, chest. And it's, and it's kind of weird, well actually it gets even weirder rather, because they haven't put the battery under the floor, no. And they, well, they do have one version of it, but they're calling that the lower capacity version. Why, Lotus, why? I, I don't get that. The new lightweight battery design can accommodate like various lengths, battery sizes, and configurations, and provide weight savings of up to 37%. That's impressive. Lotus has collaborated with supply chain partner Saragans Industry and leading academics from Brunel University, London. And they're going to bring this new lightweight system to its vehicle arch architecture and other models very soon, as near as like 24, 25, or 26. I forget when. I'll put it on the screen now. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's good. They're developing their own thing. I just kind of worry that they've missed the mark that almost all other car makers have gone with the under battery floor system. And yet these, this is sort of going to actually restrict cabin space by putting that chest version battery back there. There's got to be a good reason for it, but yeah, nonetheless, yeah, good job Lotus. Volkswagen has commenced construction of a $225 million battery production facility in Haifei, China. With an area of over 45,000 square meters, the plant will be located next to production facilities of Volkswagen Anu. That's like Volkswagen's first major uh, majority owned joint venture with its all electric brands over in China. The VW uh, Anu component company, as it's called, is actually 
the first battery system plant to be wholly owned by a group in China with annual capacity at 150 to 180,000 high voltage battery systems every year. Based on the group's modular electric platform, what do we call it? Gump. Yep, I love saying that. Um, this, I think, is a good thing because, again, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Have, you know, battery plants everywhere. Hey, Elon. Hey, Giga Texas, anybody? Not Texas, Giga Australia. Yeah. Mm. At the 2021 Mackinac Policy Conference, General Motors President Mark Rees revealed GM's group's uh, three new electric motors, all for its Ultium-based EVs. Designed by GM, the 180 kilowatt front drive motor, 255 kilowatt dual motor, and 62 kilowatt all-wheel drive assist motor are all part of the Ultium drive system. The 180 and 255 kilowatt units feature permanent magnet motors designed with the aim of minimizing reliance on heavy rare earth materials, whilst the 62 kilowatt version has an induction motor design. As many as three electric motors can be used in one EV and variations of this will actually be seen in the 2022 GMC Hummer EV, which GM tells us will have an estimated output of 745 kilowatts of power. Rolls-Royce, renowned luxury car and aircraft engine maker, has completed its maiden voyage of its brand new electric plane, the Spirit of Innovation. This electric airplane can do 480 kilometers or 300 miles per hour with a 400 kilowatt motor and an unspecified battery which Rolls-Royce claims is the most power dense battery pack ever assembled for an aircraft. Having now completed a 15 minute flight on September 15, the spirit of innovation is like an important step in shifting transportation to electrified form. Hopefully we'll see a demonstration flight in Australia, who knows when, and it kind of reminds me of, you know, that thing that used to happen way back in the last century, yeah, around 1910, just near my house here in Diggers Breast, Harry Houdini actually did a demonstration flight in his uh, Voisin, yeah, Voisin plane. Yeah, so I hope this sort of stuff starts happening and you'll start seeing them at air shows and, you know, demos and people come actually look at them who maybe not so interested in electric stuff now, but they will be, I guarantee it. Before I get into my final story, if you enjoy this sort of content, subscribe, it's absolutely free. But if you wanna see it more often, get behind the scenes, news, polls, and stuff that I just can't show you here on YouTube, consider joining me on Patreon, where from as little as $2.50 per month, you get all this and a lot more. And a big thank you to my Patreons, in particular my producers, Adam Tyson, Alan Byrne, Ashley Hill, Chaotic Media Technology, David Lenham, MN ICT Specialist, Nigel Farrier, and Tessa Nagong. Okay, up next, Tesla Australia has announced an expansion of its virtual power plant offering with Victorians now able to jump on board this exciting project. For those unfamiliar with it, South Australia was one of the first sites in the world to create a virtual power plant using Tesla Power Walls. At first, with 1,000 of them on the South Australian network, they recently approved an additional 3,000 units. It's hoped within several years, the entire scale of the project will be more than 50,000 interconnected and providing clean, green, renewable power to local community. Now, Tesla, in association with Energy Locals, they're like the same electricity provider over in South Australia, by the way, they've opened up this VPP to Victorians who actually already own a power wall. Tesla says that the virtual power plant allows users to actually maximize the energy savings through flexible time of use rates. For me, in Taylor's legs, that looks like this. Feed-in tariff for excess solar at 7 kilowatts per hour. Electricity charge of between 16.5 cents to 29.7 cents per kilowatt hour. For people who live in a controlled load zone, not me, your electricity rate will be 17.02 cents. And these rates are, in my opinion, pretty good. And they actually include uh, carbon offsets because that's what the energy locals actually do. And plus they're Australian, so winning. The daily charge of $1.10 is pretty good compared to like my current rate, but it gets better. The interesting line here is annual grid support credit of $220 per year per Powerwall. That means you get $18.30 off your bill every month 
just for being part of the VPP program, and that in turn more than halves the daily feed-in rate. It's looking promising. In addition, you also get an additional 5-year warranty on top of the Powerwall's standard 10-year warranty. Nice, and that's actually reassuring given like that the Victorian Tesla VPP could drain your battery up to 50 times per year, which isn't as bad as it sounds. Energy Locals keeps your battery at 20% for you to use, and sometimes, let's me, let me just zoom in here, uh, they might only take just 1% of your battery, and that is actually counted as one discharge event. Some people will be excited by this, and indeed it is attractive, but there are a few things to consider, and that is, obviously, you need a power wall first and foremost, and for us, based upon our experience today, it will take you at least 10 years to repay one of these things. Your solar system size must be less than 15 kilowatts per power wall, and you must have a smart meter installed, which I'm pretty certain like most Australians actually have nowadays. Maybe? Correct me if I'm wrong, please. Will we switch? Mm, I don't think so. For us, we actually have only a 4.5 kilowatt solar system, and we absolutely need more. And that way, uh, our power wall could actually be filled up a lot quicker. In summertime, it fills by about ooh, 12, 1 o'clock every day, and then from there, you start exporting out to the grid. That means only four to five hours of actual exports go out, meaning only a dollar or so saving per day because of the system we have. So realistically, I'd much rather use the power that's actually stored in the power wall and use it ourselves because, let's face it, seven, seven, seven cents per kilowatt hour uh, to sell in, and the actual buying rate is more than twice to three times that depending when you use that electricity. So I just figure you're actually better off using that energy, that green, that green clean energy that you've created yourself and using it yourself. In addition, if there was a blackout, it would mean that my battery might actually be drained by the VPP. And then when I want to go use it and there's only 20% left in the battery, that's only like a bit over two kilowatts of power. That would only last in this household on average use about one to two hours. So I'd much rather have a better backup than that. Am I wrong? Maybe. If you've got a power wall, would you switch? In fact, you know what, even if you haven't got a power wall, what do you think about this deal? Is this something that excites you, would you like, like to get into? I must point out that this is actually a little bit different to what's actually um, occurred in South Australia, where they've actually been helping people get power walls installed into their homes with a significant subsidy, as much as like about five or $7,000. So essentially halving the price of the Tesla power wall to get them into homes over there. Uh, so yeah, this is a little bit different and um, yeah, be curious to see how many Victorians actually pick up this deal. Okay, that will do it for today's episode. I do hope you've enjoyed it and if you watched it now, thanks, do appreciate it. Again, kiss the subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you to my patrons and you know what you can do, be good and be green.